Well, hey everybody, thanks for thanks so much for, for being with us today. I'm Sean, I'm with North Branch Nature Center. Um, and I'd like to uh, say a couple of quick words before we kick things off. First of all, I wanna uh, give a thank you to our sponsors um, to, that make Naturalist Journeys possible. This is our 26th year, I think, of Naturalist Journeys um, and our biggest one ever. So thanks very much to Hunger Mountain Co-op. Thanks to uh, Onion River Outdoors, to Union Mutual, to Washington Electric Co-op and to the Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix for making all of this possible. And also thank you to um, all of you, our audience, our, our North Branch members for supporting us. It's thanks to you all that we can do this as well. Um, if you wanna take a moment while we're uh, learning about truffles to pop over and uh, support the Nature Center, um, we would be appreciative of a membership or a donation or, or anything else. Um, we'd love for you to um, join our community if you're not already part of, uh, of the team here. Um, so I'll put a link in the chat to that. I'll also put a link to Rowan's uh, website as well. And, um, and I'll also put a link to, uh, over to Bear Pond Books uh, where you can get a copy of, uh, of, the, of the book. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or in the Q&A um, as we go. Those questions will come to uh, Rowan and I, and I'll hold on to those questions and I'll, I'll kind of moderate those um, at the end of the talk tonight. So feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, and that's all I have on, on my housekeeping list. So without further ado, Rowan, it's so exciting to finally have you um, uh, back to the Nature Center to, to share your latest work with us. And, and uh, I look forward to learning about truffles. So take it away, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sean. It, yeah, it's great that um, I've been wanting to do something for the Nature Center for uh, a long time, and we finally got it worked out tonight, thanks to the magic of uh, a Zoom. So it's really good to be here. And I will second that um, that motion to, if you get a chance to support the Nature Center in any way, please do, because it's pretty amazing that the level of programming that they're able to put on. Uh, tonight, the programming is going to be all about truffles. And uh, I know this is, you know, sounds like a weird subject for a Vermont uh, webinar, but I assure you, by the end of this webinar, you, you will realize that Vermont is the perfect place to be talking about this stuff. Uh, so, um, the, I, so uh, as Sean mentioned, I have a new book out called Truffle Hound, and it was basically the... Um, the, the product of two or three years of truffle hunting around uh, mostly Europe and North America uh, to sort of understand this thing. I, I got a whiff of a really good truffle when I was in Italy a few years ago, and the smell was so extraordinary, and the mysteries of truffles were, were so deep that, that, that it seemed like really rich ground, and I wanted to understand where that smell came from and um, why that smell existed. So that was sort of the beginning of my journey. But as I got into it, I realized that truffles are incredibly interesting organisms from both um, uh, an e ecological perspective and a sociological perspective. And those are the, kind of the two things I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, but before I, I go deep into it, um, I should clarify about what I mean when I say a truffle, because a lot of people's first thought when they hear truffle is chocolate truffles. Uh, but those are not the original truffles. Chocolate truffles were named that because of their resemblance to these guys. These are the, the real deal. Um, these are five different species of truffles, all from Europe. Um, and a truffle is, it's very closely related to a mushroom, but it's a little bit different. Um, the main difference is where a mushroom pops up above the surface and opens its parasol and lets its spores spread around through the wind with the goal of making more of the organisms that make the mushroom. A truffle wants to do the same thing, but it stays underground. So it's like a mushroom that never opens up and never pops above the surface. And so its spores are in the inside and it has a whole different life challenge because of that. And that's kind of the key to the whole thing, which we'll get to in a little bit. So the other, uh, the other thing I wanted to tackle straight up front is truffle oil, because a lot of people think they have experienced truffle uh, because they've had truffle oil in something or a product that was flavored with truffle, like truffle potato chips or truffle popcorn or something. And all of those products, including truffle oil, don't actually have any truffle in them. They're made with a synthetic chemical. So it's kind of like any other artificial flavoring. It gives sort of like a very crude sense of truffleness, but 
if, if once you smell a real truffle, you realize this really doesn't have much to do with it. So I mean, a lot of people who have had truffle oil or truffle potato chips or whatever, and kind of don't understand what all the fuss is about. Um, and that's because when you experience a real truffle, it's a whole different, uh, different ball, ball game. So the place that most people have uh, experienced truffles is, uh, or the, mo the most like famous place to experience truffles is here at the um, Alba International White Truffle Fair in Northern Italy in the Piedmont region. And that was where I kind of had my first truffle experience a few years ago. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, as you can tell, it doesn't really look like a food festival. It looks more like a gem and minerals show. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, truffles, they're dug underground and, and they are so incredibly expensive that they're treated almost more like a gem than a food item. So like when you're in the hall where the festival is, you've got all these truffle dealers who have acquired these truffles from hunters all over the place. And the truffles are under glass. And, uh, you know, you go by, you walk, walk through and they'll lift the glass so you can get a smell of the truffles and see the prices. And the prices are um, remarkable. Uh, here's a, these are sort of like mid-sized truffles. It's always sort of by weight, but so these are the prices in euros for some of the white truffles at the truffle fair. And these guys are probably a quarter pound maybe. Um, but so 500 euros, 600 euros. So that's going to be like 700 bucks. They're incredibly expensive. It's the most expensive food in the world. And that's all because of its smell. Um, there's hundreds of different aromatic compounds involved in the smell of a truffle. And there's nothing like it. it um, it's a mix of all kinds of crazy stuff. There's notes of garlic and notes of like prosciutto, but then there's also pheromones and like cannabinoids. It's, it's an incredibly complex mix of smells. Um, so the, the other thing about uh, the Alba Fair when you're there is you realize it's like, it's a very sort of like high-end luxury item. This is a, uh, a, a, a still shot from the movie, The Truffle Hunters which some of you might have seen. It was playing at the Savoy in Montpelier uh, back in like December, I think, maybe November. Uh, and it's a documentary about these sort of elderly truffle hunters in the Piedmont region where this fair takes place. And um, it captures, this scene to me, it captures sort of this one thing about truffles that, I, that bugs me. And, and, and that's that it's become such a luxury item. Yeah, the, the truffle industry, to their credit, has positioned truffles as this thing that you should pay a lot of money for, and, and that's worked out pretty well for them. But it, it, I think it actually has ended up um, selling truffles short now, and I think it's starting to change. And so part of the reason I wrote my book is to sort of rethink what truffles could be, especially here in America. So this guy is um, the most famous like truffle judge in the world. He's kind of in charge of the festival. And so this scene from the movie sort of captures the, the high end um, positioning of truffles. It's very much like wine snobbery. So in, if you guys haven't seen the movie, it's a very formal stage scene where he's sitting in a fancy restaurant all alone. And he's got his like, you know, plate of, of polenta and, and eggs and a, a waiter comes and shaves the truffle over his eggs, like a, in a very formal ceremony. And then he like leans down and sniffs the truffle. And it feels like, you know, there's a certain amount of awe um, associated with it, but it also feels really formal and really stiff. And it's kind of off-putting, I think, to a lot of people. And what I really learned as I dive deeper into truffles is that the, the, the truffle itself, probably this is not the world that it would be comfortable in. It's, it's much more of a, a down to earth grassroots kind of organism. Um, so I'm kind of thinking that the time has come to, to rethink truffles. But the other thing that strikes you when you're at the fair is that um, there's a lot of chicanery in the truffle business. So, so Everyone in Italy will tell you that all the truffles, the white truffles in the world are coming from that Northern Italian region. That's sort of like the official story. 
And it, the Trouble Hunters, that documentary also sort of like positions that story. That's where all those guys are hunting. But the thing is, uh, truffles are this organism that has a, a symbiotic relationship with trees. They only grow in forests under trees. And when you're in this Piedmont region of Italy and you look around, you don't see a lot of trees. This is what you see, um, vineyards. So this is also Italy's uh, top wine region. This is where Barolo comes from and, and some of Italy's other um, most highly prized wines. Um, and every single you know, slope that can be converted into one of these super valuable vineyards has. So the only forest that remains is these little tiny patches that weren't appropriate for vines. So you're, like, you're at the truffle fair where you've got hundreds of thousands of visitors coming and consuming thousands or tens of thousands of white truffles. And you think like, wow, how could these possibly be coming from these little tiny patches of forest that still exist? And, and the answer of course is that they don't. Um, and I'll just, I'll stick a pin in that for now. We'll come back to that in a little while. But now real quick, I want to back up and talk about what a truffle is and like its whole ecology, because that's going to feed into this. So as I said, truffles are these, these uh, organisms, these, these fungi that live underground. And truffles are actually just the fruiting body. So the, the organism itself is a fungus that consists of miles of microscopic threads that sort of weave their way through the soil, mining nutrients. And this is true for both truffles and, and a lot of mushrooms. So these threads that are in the soil are really, really good at extracting water and minerals and other nutrients from the soil. So what they've done is partnered with all these tree species um, where they literally wrap their threads around the roots of the tree system and interpenetrate the cells of the roots so that they can share nutrients back and forth. And you can sort of see it in this diagram here. Let me see if I can turn on my, uh, my laser pointer. Yeah. Okay. You can see your cursor. Okay, cool. Um, so these little white threads here are the actual organism that makes the mushrooms or truffles. Um, and so all the nutrients that it is acquiring are sort of following this blue arrow path into the tree roots and then into the tree. And the tree loves all this stuff, says thank you very much. Um, and then in exchange, the tree is making sugars through photosynthesis with its leaves and sending those sugars back down to the, the fungus. So it's this beautiful partnership. Uh, this type of fungus is called a mycorrhizal fungus. Uh, mycorrhiza is Greek for tree root, literally. Um, and, and these types of symbiotic relationships are actually essential to the health of every forest on earth, pretty much. Most of these trees would not be able to flourish without their mycorrhizal partners, which are much better at getting these nutrients out of the soil than the tree roots are. The tree roots are really, they, they, they depend on, on these mycorrhiza. Um, so in, in recent years, we've, scientists have really understood how essential these, um, these mycorrhiza are to the health of the forests. But one of the really interesting things they've learned, and that has gotten a lot of attention in sort of like the uh, mainstream science news, is that the organisms, they don't just connect to a single tree, they connect to a bunch of different trees. And they don't just connect to trees of one species, it'll be a bunch of different species of trees, and even other plants, like you can see in this diagram that they're kind of linking to this plant as well as this tree. So one single um, mycorrhizal fungus might be connected to dozens of trees and other plants uh, and of, of several different species. And it's swapping nutrients and resources between all of them. So it really becomes this, uh, this common network that forests use to shift nutrients around where they're most needed. And, and it kind of provides a whole higher level of intelligence and organization to the forest. And as scientists have, um, have really realized what's going on here um, and published their results, which kind of like launched like a thousand avatar comparisons uh, because people started to realize like, okay, forests are actually coordinating their actions at a level that we never understood before. So this, is, this has become um, a, a really interesting new, new area of, of research. And the woman who really kicked it off was this uh, researcher up in British Columbia named Suzanne Samard. 
she just published her um, her book last year called Finding the Mother Tree about this um, this whole process. Um, if you're interested, definitely read it. Um, Bear Pond Books, I, I'm sure has a copy. But as she published these results, um, and then Nature picked up on it and published her work and dubbed it the Wood Wide Web, it really spilled over into the public imagination. Um, people love this idea that trees were coordinating um, and that like trees that had lots of resources to give would share with other trees that didn't have so many resources. Um, and it even spilled over into things like Richard Power's book, The Overstory, where one of the characters is based on Suzanne Samard. Um, and what I, there's, um, there's a couple of things that I think are um, really interesting about this. But one is how, like, how this works for the, the mycorrhizal fungi themselves. So as I, as I mentioned, all these, these mycorrhiza, they, when they need to reproduce, they either make mushrooms or they make truffles. And if it's a mushroom, it pops up above the surface, opens up, and the spores just spread through the wind. Um, but with a truffle, it works very differently. And this, is, this kind of shows the whole process. So here's your tree roots. And here's these little sort of like corn dogs, which are the ac actual mycorrhiza that form almost like, like a glove on a hand around the tree roots, which is actually the fungus. Um, and then when the fungus finds another fungus and mates, it makes mushrooms or it makes truffles. And if it's a truffle, it stays underground. And that's usually because uh, it's somewhere where maybe the client the, the the climate is too dry so if it was a mushroom and it popped up um it, it would dry out before it got to spread its spores or maybe there's a lot of things that eat mushrooms up above the surface so it's rather it would rather stay below but anyway it has a whole new challenge on its hands so it makes this little uh truffle which is a, a roundish ball full of spores but how is it going to get that spore to spread through the forest when it's underground and the ingenious method that the truffle has come up with is to basically commandeer all the little, the little mammals in the forest to do it for, for it. So, and how to do that? By smelling so ridiculously attractive to those little mammals that they will drop whatever they're doing and immediately, as soon as they detect the truffle through smell, they'll tunnel underground to get to the truffle and eat it. Um, and so there are lots and lots of animals, mostly mammals, that go crazy for truffles, including voles, squirrels, but even bigger animals like pigs, deer, uh, and us, the, and um, even baboons. It's it's all over the place in every continent. Truffles have figured out how to drive uh, mammals crazy, basically. So the 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 vole, the squirrel, whatever it is, eats the truffle, grabs the truffle, carries it around, eventually spreads the spores through the forest um, in its droppings. And then those spores germinate and hopefully find a new tree root and the process begins all over again. Now here's, here's what those spores look like under a microscope. They're pretty cool. Although it's funny, I now realize that they look a little bit like coronaviruses. But so where do we come into it? We love the smell of truffles and, and that's something we share with all these other animals. So one of the things I think that is fun is that it, a truffle smell is a really strange smell, but when we smell it, uh, it helps us understand something we have in common with all these other very different creatures. We all like the smell for whatever reason. But we alone of, of the truffle enthusiasts can't really smell a truffle from above the ground. Our noses just aren't good enough. So we need a partner who can do the smelling part for us. Uh, and people always ask about pigs, right? Like pigs are famous for, um, for truffle hunting. But the reality is pigs were never ideal for it. They were probably the original partners that people use for truffle hunting because probably like farmers noticed that pigs would root around in the forest and dig these things up and eat them enthusiastically whenever they got the chance. But um, pigs are so enthusiastic about truffles and so large and insistent that it was always problematic. So it's really hard to keep the pig from eating the truffle. And it, besides, if you're a truffle hunter and you're trying to sneak through the woods and find truffles without anyone knowing what you're doing, as soon as you load a pig into your fiat, everyone knows exactly what you're doing. So long ago, everybody switched to dogs. There's really no, no truffle hunting pigs uh, that are active anymore. Um, and dogs are just 
awesome for the job because they love the hunt um, and they're really good at it. They're really smart. They're good at understanding what you need and they're incredibly good at detecting the truffles underground. And they don't actually care that much about eating the truffle that most of them are just as happy to get a treat. So dogs have been the, the truffle hunting partner for people for since the 1700s really. Um, people like to ask me like, what dog is the right dog for truffle hunting? And there's kind of a couple different answers to that question. If you ask someone in Italy, they're going to say a Lagotto Romagnolo, which is this Italian breed that's specifically bred for truffle hunting and has been for centuries. Uh, these are Lagotos here, these three. Um, these are Lagotos, and that's a Lagotto. As you can tell, they're closely related to poodles. They're probably the ancestor of the poodle. Um, and like poodles, they're really smart. They're really high energy. They live to truffle hunt. So they're great at it. But the, the people who are really, really good at this, the real pros who do it every day, tell me that any dog can do it. And I've definitely seen lots of different dogs do it. These are all truffle hunting dogs I've met. So this German short haired pointer was incredibly good at it. Uh, black labs, I've, I've met several black labs who were really good at it. And surprisingly, a couple of dachshunds that were really good at it too. Uh, and even one chihuahua, who we'll talk about a little bit later. So pretty much any dog, um, you, you get them when they're a puppy, uh, train them just by like, you know, you play catch with a truffle until they get really like excited about it. They get a treat every time they bring it back. Then you make it harder, you start burying the truffle. And then eventually, hopefully you get so that when you go out in the woods with them, they'll find the wild truffles. But where do you do that? So like I said earlier, if you ask someone in Italy, especially Northern Italy, they're gonna say like, well, there are, the only place you can do that is up here. Um, this is where all the white truffles come from. But this is a map I found of where white truffles have been found. So as you can see, yes, Northern Italy is pretty good, but so is Central Italy, um, all the way down through Tuscany and Umbria and La Marche. But check out Eastern Europe. Now, this is really the truffle hotspot. And in a way, it's no surprise. Truffles don't read maps. Uh, they do like limestone or any other sort of uh, bedrock that's rich in calcium so that the soil will be really high in calcium and pH. And you find that type of, of limestone from Italy all the way east to the Black Sea. So all of Eastern Europe is just chock full of white truffles. And this is actually the real truffle hunting hotspot. But the funny thing is the, the Italians were so good at building a market for white truffles that um, everyone else who was finding them simply sold them to Italy because there was no, no one was going to like Hungary or Serbia or uh, Romania and looking for a nice truffle dinner. Everyone was coming to Italy for that. So long ago, Italian buyers learned to just sort of cruise through Eastern Europe, buy all the truffles and send them back to Italy. So they'd all be consumed in Italy at places like the Alba Truffle Fair but the majority of them were really coming from Eastern Europe, which is the, the case today. And it's kind of like the worst kept secret in the truffle business. But what struck me is that um, it's actually so much more of an interesting story than sort of the old school story that Italians have been telling about this super high end luxury item that needs to be eaten in this very stuffy formal way in Northern Italy. Um, so once I started, getting into like the, the places that were really producing these truffles and hunting these truffles and that that had sort of a culture of working with these truffles built i realized like that's that's what makes truffles fun and interesting and um the like the old school myths that people are still sort of insisting on are just doing themselves a disservice by keeping the real story uh, out of the public eye so now more and more the, the real story is coming into the public eye. So from Northern Italy, I actually traveled down to uh, Central Italy to a town called Aquilania, which is in La Marche, which is east of Tuscany and Umbria, to find like the real center of Italian truffles. And this is what it looks like. So instead of like big cities surrounded by vineyards, you've got this tiny town of 4,000 people uh, where the forest creeps up right to the edge of the town. And this is their little truffle festival that they have every year. It's all Italians there. I was the only English speaker. Um, and everyone is consuming truffles. And half the people there are actually 
in the truffle business in one way, either as hunters or um, truffle sellers or restaurateurs or dog trainers. And this is what you want to see because you want the forest is where the truffles are. Um, so it's really the places in Italy that are forests that you find them. <coughs> yeah, in um, La Marque, they have four different species of truffles. And in the cute little truffle museum that they have, they celebrate them all. <coughs> um, it's, it's, um, it gives you a sense of what a real truffle town is like because they live and breathe truffles. Like they don't really have a whole lot of options here. Truffles made this town what it is. <clears throat> this is also where you find the big ones. So this was a, uh, the biggest one I ever found is about 1.3 or the biggest one, I, I mean, I didn't find it. I came across 1.3 kilos, I think. Um, the smell was out of control. And I got to sniff it like right before it got overnighted by DHL to some uh, client in New York City. So I don't know what became of it, but it was amazing. So that became kind of like my, my model is follow the forests. So from central Italy, I basically followed the forests, followed the limestone in the forests right under the Adriatic to the other side to Croatia. This is a town called Motovan um, in Istria, which is this peninsula of Croatia that sort of juts out into the Adriatic. Um, and you'd think it was an Italian, you know, hill town to look at it. But you look around, you see all these forests. That's what you want to see for a truffle town. And Motovan is probably the most intense truffle town on earth. These forests are famously loaded with truffles and it's pretty much the entire economy there except for a little bit of tourism and the two are closely linked. Uh, but uh, the vibe is really different there. Like this felt to me much more like sort of like the roots of, of, of truffle culture. And that's when I got thinking about the sociology. So here's your typical Istrian truffle hunter. This is a woman named Radmila Karlic. She's a second generation truffle hunter. Um, her dad hunted truffles. And then when she was a little girl, she declared that she wanted to be a truffle hunter too. And her mom said, don't do that. No one will ever marry you if you become a truffle hunter. But she persisted and she did get married. And now her kids are truffle hunters too. And even her mom has converted at like age 70 and now goes out in the forest every day with her tiny little dog. So you got three generations of, of Carlich women hunting truffles in Istria. And they've made a really good livelihood out of it, which is the case throughout Istria. Um, everyone there told me that, um, you know, you look at the houses, you can tell what the people do. If they only have one story, they're a farmer. If they have two stories, they're a truffle hunter. Um, and what's, what everyone told me there is that truffles saved Istria. So this is part of Croatia, which used to be Yugoslavia, and has seen a lot of really hard economic times. So after World War II, the whole communist era, the, the economy was kind of in the doldrums. And then came the Balkan Wars and things only got worse. Uh, but Istria was always sort of excluded from that because they had this truffle thing going. And the thing about truffles is there are these organisms that love the shadows and they're always like accomplishing things out of the mainstream. So the mainstream economy might have sucked, but there were still all these Italian buyers coming to Istria and buying the truffles and paying you know, good cash for the truffles and bringing them back to Italy. And that worked great for the Istrians. So they were always able to um, have a really healthy economy and lifestyle through this, this completely underground network that to me is kind of like a mirror of the literal underground network that the trouble forms with trees. So this is um, Radmila's daughter uh, hunting with her uh, boyfriend. And the other thing they told me is that um, Whereas almost everywhere in Eastern Europe kind of lost their younger generations to Western Europe where the jobs were. In Istria, the kids never left because they could always have a really good life and make a good living hunting truffles in the woods. So I realized that they're, they're kind of like this 21st century hunter-gatherer economy that's really rare. Um, and all be, it's all because it's, it's um, a, 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 not exactly a black market, but a gray market business, um, which made me appreciate the, the um, sort of resilience of those types of um, of business of of economies that gr that evolve over time. It kind of reminded me of the lobster business in Maine a little bit. 
So even though for decades, they just sold all of their travels to Italy and were happy to pocket the cash and be done with it. Lately, Istria and other places in Eastern Europe kind of have realized that they don't need to do that anymore, that people will come to them to experience truffle hunting and truffle, truffle cooking and, and just like truffle lifestyles. So they're, um, they're having their own truffle festivals all across uh, Croatia for sure, but also elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, and they're trying to sort of, they're rebranding themselves. So this little town right next to Motovan in Istria called Levade has called, decided it is the world truffle center. Um, it's a stretch right now, because as you can see, there's like six buildings in all of Levade and their, um, their little truffle monument maybe didn't come out so good. But still, they're, they're, you can see what the future is going to be. Like all these towns saying, come experience real truffle culture with us. And this is my little reminder to myself that uh, we love questions. So if you guys have thought of any questions you'd like to ask, plug them into the chat or the Q&A, and we'll get to them in a few minutes here at the end. So one of the other things I discovered is that every country in Europe sort of has its own truffle story and none of them fit what's happened in other countries. So Istria, because of its proximity to Italy, always sort of had this, this truffle uh, economy that like, these little tentacles of, of economic activity that pulled Istria into Italy in the symbiotic relationship. Hungary also had good truffles, but it wasn't close enough to Italy. So after World War II, as the communist um, era took hold, it kind of lost its whole truffle culture because there was no one to sell to and truffles were considered a little too Western and decadent. So there was no local truffle um, business. But the truffles were all there and they still are. Um, Budapest is actually one of the only large cities I know, well, probably the only large city where you can actually hunt truffles right in the city limits. The parks actually have um, a lot of black truffles. But so Hungary had this old tradition of truffle hunting and they still have this great like folk art of truffle hunters, but they lost it and now they're trying to revive it. Uh, so this is a guy, he's actually one of the leading mycologists at the university in Budapest. His name is Zoltan. Um, so he's a mycologist by day, but by night he is the grandmaster of the Hungarian truffling knights. So this is something that France has a little bit and Hungary has sort of adopted it from France. So. Every now and then, um, when the need arises, he dons his robes and puts on his truffle medallion and grabs his truffle shield. And um, the Hungarian truffle knights further the cause of truffles, uh, which mostly involves drinking a lot of wine and having truffle feasts. But it does help further the cause. So uh, meanwhile, there's this amazing truffle hunting going on in Italy by, uh, in Hungary by people who don't have anything to do with the truffle knights. Their, their truffle knight is not sort of their, their vibe. So this guy, Istvan, was probably the best truffle hunter I ever met. And his dog, Mocha, was the best truffle hunter I ever met. And they have created this amazing network of truffle hunters in Southern Italy. Uh, and they're finding incredible amounts of white truffles, partly because the hunting is good um, and partly because they're just really good at it. So, so they were amazing. I, we would go into the forest and Mocha knows so much that Isfahan would just say to Mocha, okay, like today we're hunting black truffles or today we're hunting white truffles. And Mocha would say like, all right, boss, here I go. And he would go off and just find whichever truffle you had told him to find so he can differentiate. Um, he also like, if, if you're, if Istvan was digging, so the way it works is the dog finds the spot. The dog is like going through the forest, checking each tree. And, and when he smells that there's a truffle underground, he'll mark the spot by scratching um, with his paw. But then, so you're kind of guessing as you're going down, you might be off by a little bit. So if Isfahan was off by a few inches, Mocha would come in there with his nose and sort of push Isfahan out of the way and then tap his nose at the right spot to dig to get right to the truffle. So it was kind of like, it made me realize that the people who are really good at this, it's, it's an incredible art. Um, and the, watching a dog and a truffle hunter work together, it, it's just like this sort of beautiful relationship where they understand each other through all these different ways. Um, and the other really interesting thing was what you do once you find a truffle. And it made me realize that um, that old network 
of selling to a local buyer who would then sell to a middleman who would then sell to one of the big trouble companies might not survive the technological changes. Um, and that could actually be a good thing in some cases. So when Ispan finds a really nice white truffle, first thing he does is gets out his phone, snaps a photo of it, and just starts texting chefs and like truffle buyers he knows in like London and Berlin and even Tokyo and says, hey, like I just found this. I, I'm guessing it weighs 300 grams or whatever. Here's the price. Are you interested? And so within like 50 or 20 minutes, he, he's still in the middle of the woods. He's got the truffle sold. And so then that night he'll go to DHL or wherever and overnight the truffle to his client. And what that means is that um, you're getting, uh, truffles are getting to chef's tables way faster than ever before and in better shape. And the money, more of the money is coming straight to the truffle hunter. So it's actually um, going to support these rural lifestyles in a way that's even better than it ever has before, possibly. And it, it was interesting to meet some of the people who are dependent on truffle hunting. So not only would Ispan find his own truffles, but we would have prearranged meetings in parking lots with other people who are hunting truffles in Hungary. And it was often people who were kind of like on the outskirts of society. Uh, this is a family of Roma um, who used to be called gypsies, who are sort of like keep to themselves in Hungarian society. Um, and don't have access to many jobs, but they can hunt truffles with the best of them. So they would find all these truffles and they didn't really have a market for them. So Istvan would buy their truffles and then um, sell them, you know, to some of his clients. But so we would just meet, you know, they'd be in a pickup truck, they'd get out of scale um, and put it on the hood of the truck and then grab a bowl and put the truffles inside. And we'd go through and check the ones for quality and then cash would be handed over on the hood and then off we would go. And that, from my understanding is how a lot of truffle hunting works in Europe, Eastern Europe in particular. Then in the night we would find a truffle hunter crash pad. So these guys are often many hours from their homes hunting truffles. So they have these houses where they just uh, crash. And it's just like, it's kind of like deer camp in Vermont. Like it's a lot of dogs, dirt and dudes and beer. And I wasn't sure how they were gonna feel about an American journalist, uh, you know, like, checking out what they were doing. Cause like I said, it all feels slightly underground when you're doing it, uh, but I was surprised. They were super eager to show me um, what they do and how they do it. So they all have their different trowels that they use for digging truffles. And, and when I asked them what they liked about truffle hunting, they said uh, free, like it keeps us free, which in Hungary is a big deal because uh, freedom is, is uh, getting rare and rare in Hungary. So. The truffles secretive ways were allowing them a level of autonomy that I think we take for granted in the US, but is, is pretty rare in Hungary. So all those kind of experiences, as I've been hinting, kind of got me thinking differently about truffles and connecting what they do underground with what they do in human communities. Um, and so, yeah, these, these, these common networks that they form with trees and plants for resource sharing that kind of strengthens the whole superorganism. I suddenly started to realize that, um, you know, thanks to dogs being these mediums that understand truffles through scent, but also understand the human world, they're able to extend these networks above ground through scent to pull in human communities and pull in human resources in a way that actually protects the forest. Uh, because once um, a truffle forest is recognized to be producing all these truffles every year, and there's a ton of value coming out of the forest, you're not gonna be cutting down that truffle forest anytime soon. Your, your local truffle hunters will riot. So a truffle forest is a really valuable thing. Um, so it's uh, truffles in a sense are extending their network of protection through these forests. Um, and to me that it's just like, it makes you realize how incredibly in intelligent these organisms are um, in an evolutionary sense. So up to now, everything I've been talking about has been for uh, white truffles, which are only found in the wild. But there's another famous truffle, maybe even more famous, the black truffle of France. And its story is, is different. And that's because no one has ever figured out how to cultivate the white truffle, but people have known how to cultivate the black truffle for a long time. They've gotten really good at it. 
So 95, 96% of the production of black truffles happens on farms now. You, what you do basically is you take baby oak trees. This truffle likes to partner with oaks and hazels. Um, you inoculate the, the roots of the seedling trees with truffle spores. Then you plant the trees and you wait like eight years and then they start producing truffles. So this, this truffle is widely farmed, originally in France. These are sort of its natural habitats and everyone associates it with France. Um, but it actually grows in certain spots in Italy and it grows a lot in Spain. Spain is really the hotbed um, in part because of the Spanish government, which took all these uh, regions in central Spain that were really suffering. The farms weren't very productive because it was too dry for you know, cereals or, or normal crops. Um, and the towns were really dying out. Again, most of the youth had moved to the cities. So Spain like threw all of this money at these farmers um, and gave them everything they would need to start planting truffles and said, try truffles. And it worked incredibly well. So what you see in, in Aragon in central Spain is just these vast, vast orchards of oak trees. And the oak, you're growing the oak because of the truffles that are gonna grow with the oak. Um, and then you've got some skinny dog going, just going down the, the row and digging up truffle after truffle after truffle. So it's incredibly productive and it's really turned these towns around and they're, they're um, really well off towns now. And again, they, the youth are back. Like they've had to build new schools because of the new people moving to town to truffle farm. So this is where most of the world's black truffles are coming from. Uh, what about the US? Well, we've tried to get in on that, that truffle farming game uh, with some success. This is a, tr a black truffle farm in Oregon. Uh, but as you can see, it looks different. It doesn't look like Spain. Oregon's a wetter climate. The soil's different. Um, it's all a little different. Um, they don't use oak trees so much as hazel trees, which grow better. But it hasn't worked great. Like, there's a lot of truffle farms in California, a lot in the Pacific Northwest, and a lot in kind of the North Carolina, uh, Tennessee area. Um, but none of them are producing big amounts. Like a, a typical farm might produce like eight or nine truffles a year. And they keep waiting. Like every year they think, all right, next year the production will start to go up, but it really isn't. So um, it seems like there's some piece of it we're missing. Something about North America is just different and you can't do here what you can do in Europe. But I actually think that is an opportunity that is eventually going to make uh, North America the most exciting and diverse and sort of dynamic uh, player in the truffle game. And that's because since the European black truffle doesn't work that well here, people are trying all sorts of different things. So this group in North Carolina um, decided to try this different truffle called the Bianchetto. It's a truffle that's native to Italy and it's kind of considered secondary to the, the white truffle, but it likes sandy soil and it loves to grow with pine trees. Pines are its favorite partner. So uh, these guys are in North Carolina, you know, and they're like, okay, Southeast, that's our main tree. Like all the, all the timber industry through the 14 Southeast states is based on the loblolly pine. So like, can we grow this truffle with loblolly pine? And the answer is yes, it grows incredibly well. Uh, last year, these guys had this explosion of truffles. Every little flag you see back here in the background marks a spot where a truffle has been found, but it wasn't mature yet. So they didn't want to dig it up yet. But they've been getting production of like 200 pounds per acre, which the, the second best in the US is like one pound per acre. So huge, huge success story. Here's the Bianchetto truffle. It's good, not great, but it's good. So um, it's going to introduce a lot more people to truffles. But what I'm even more excited about are the native truffles of North America. Um, not that many people know that North America has native truffles. And that's just because of this weird catch 22 where uh, because no one thought there were truffles here, <laughs> there was no reason to train a dog to find them. So we have no truffle dogs. And if you have no truffle dogs, you're not gonna find any truffles. Um, so <clears throat> the truffles have always been there, it turns out. It's just, we never had dogs to let us know they were there. And that is finally beginning to change. And um, partly because of uh, this guy, Charles Lefevre, who is a mycologist out in Oregon who started the Oregon Truffle Festival about 15 years ago. And the reason was because 
you know, as a mycologist, he knew about truffles. He'd been truffle hunting in uh, Europe. And he started finding these, these Oregon truffles and realized, like he, he'd experienced enough truffles around the world to know that the quality was extraordinary. Uh, here's the Oregon truffles. There's both a white truffle and a black truffle and a couple more. And, and they are some of the best smelling truffles in the world. They have a short shelf life, but they're extraordinary. Um, and no one knows it. So he started this truffle festival to, um, to put the word out, basically. And they, they grow with the Douglas fir. This is him hunting with his Lagoda Romagnolo in, in a Doug fir forest. But they did some smart things. So the Oregon Truffle Festival, like part of the attraction is that it's this luxury good. And so they didn't want to let that part go. So they invite some of the, you know, the best chefs in the Pacific Northwest to come each do one course. And they do this pretty fancy dinner um, with this beautiful plating and, and in all these ways to really show off these incredible aromas that these truffles have. So they do that part of it to sort of signal like, okay, this is an ingredient you should take really seriously. But they also did this thing that you don't see in Europe, which was brilliant. Um, they made it really grassroots and totally dog centric. So they started this event called the Juriad, which is the North American Truffle Dog Championship, where people could come and enter the competition and, and train their dog and also they compete to like see which dog could find the most truffles. And you know, it's not, it's, it's not a fancy thing. And quite a bit of the event is not fancy. It's like people in the woods with their dogs having fun. And because of that, it's, uh, it's drawn a whole different audience and really endeared truffles to a lot of, a lot of different people. And in 2018, they kind of had a struggle of luck where a little rescue chihuahua named Gustav won the, uh, the Truffle Dog Championship in a huge, huge upset. There were all these Lagoda Romagnolos who were well-trained and were expected to win. And Gustav pulled off this sort of like miracle victory. Um, and the story went viral. He got a lot of national attention, which of course drew all these other people into North American truffles and also made all these other people want to have a truffle dog. So now there's kind of a truffle dog craze going on in the US, especially out there in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Alana McGee, who's the, that person in drinking champagne in the orchard, uh, she launched the Truffle Dog Company a few years ago in Seattle, but they actually, they do in-person courses where they train your truffle dog or help you to train your truffle dog or take you out on forays, but they also do it online. So they'll ship you a truffle training kit and then you can do online classes. So everyone in the country can get their dog ready to go. So Things are changing. Um, we're getting more and more truffle dogs out there. It's still really early days, but more, people are now realizing that, holy cow, North America actually has a pretty great truffle scene. And uh, there's one I wanted to talk about in particular because we're here in Vermont, and that is uh, Tuber canaliculatum, the Appalachian truffle. This is a almost completely unknown truffle that I think is gonna be a game changer in the Northeast. Most people think that as Northeast in particular doesn't have any truffles, but it's because we don't have any truffle dogs. So this is a truffle. It's beautiful. You can see it has this sort of like yellowish, orangish coat and then dark marbled interior. It has an amazing smell and it grows from Quebec down to North Carolina, at least all through the Appalachians and through into the Midwest too. It's, it's found in Michigan quite a bit. But quite a bit means there's like two or three people hunting it. But it's all through this whole area. Um, but here's the problem. So in, in this picture, you are looking at the, the grand total of all the people in the country who are skilled at finding this truffle and at all the dogs who are skilled at finding this truffle. There's basically this one guy in DC uh, who has a dog who sort of accidentally learned to find this truffle and now finds quite a few. I can't say where. I, this is a shot from when I went hunting with him last fall, um, but somewhere in the Appalachians. And he sells the truffles he finds to chefs in DC. But that's it. That's the whole Appalachian truffle industry right now. But everything I, I'm, I've learned so far um, makes me think that they're everywhere. Uh, it, anywhere you've got sort of like high high pH soil is the key. And um, there's a guy up in Quebec who, who is also sort of helping create this, what could be a whole Appalachian truffle culture in, in the Northeast. 
he's the first person to figure out how to cultivate the um, the Appalachian truffle. So he's got this orchard up in Quebec where um, he inoculated the trees and they're all producing lots and lots of truffles. And he hunts them with his little, uh, his docks and uh, merguez here. Uh, but he wants to sell trees to the US. So you would buy your, um, your inoculated truffle tree seedling and plant your tree. And then a few years later, in theory, it starts producing truffles. So there's, there could be both wild and cultivated farmed truffles in the US, in throughout New England and all the way down to North Carolina um, and all the festivals that go with it. And you can see that it could be a whole sort of grassroots version of, of what Europe has had for a long time, which, which makes me really interested. And what about Vermont, right? So I thought I would end with this slide uh, because none of these travels have ever been found in Vermont that I know of, but I'm 100% certain that they're there. The travels have been found uh, in the Champlain Valley on the New York side. And um, Jerome has said to me that he's sure that the Champlain Valley in Vermont should be really good. So here's a map, um, a Vermont map of uh, bedrock in Vermont. It was actually used for a study of where the good, the best maple syrup was found, which, which was schist, the, uh, the Green Mountain bedrock, uh, mostly. But for truffles, you want limestone. And Vermont's got a lot of limestone. So, you know, that's this ancient seabed that exists in Vermont. So Champlain Valley has a lot of it, but guess what? So do we. Um, Central Vermont is actually really strong on limestone. And it goes, I think Mon this is like the berry granite, this little blob here. So I think Montpelier is somewhere around here, like right on this line between schist and limestone. But so from Montpelier Northeast um, and South a little bit, you get this amazing like ribbon of limestone. And there's every reason to believe that there are Appalachian truffles all through here. So I basically, we got to get out hunting. And uh, if anyone is interested in training their dog, I could help them do that. But I think this is going to be um, a really fun and fascinating new, uh, you know, new hobby for, for Vermonters potentially. So thanks for listening. And I would love to take any questions that you guys have. Thank you so much, Rowan. I have so, so many questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, there's uh, folks that have submitted a lot. Keep submitting them um, if you'd like in the Q&A in the chat. Um, and I have some different kind of categories of question here, I guess. And so, you know, so, like questions around like the culinary side, around the foraging side, and then around like the ecology side. So maybe we'll start with some, uh, some kind of culinary uh, uh, questions. So um, how well do they keep on the shelf? Yeah, that's an important question um, because that sort of features prominently into like the commercial potential of some of these truffles. Um, and that's the big knock on those Oregon truffles. They have great smell, but they have horrible shelf life actually. So two or three days and they go from great smell to like spawn of Satan, you know, just like horrible rotting smells. So that's why that truffle will probably never like you're never going to see like New York chefs working with that truffle from the Pacific Northwest. It just can't get there in any kind of good shape. So it's always going to be a local thing for them, which I think is fine. It's like, great. You have to be there and experience this thing really briefly. The um, other truffles like the, the French black truffle can go weeks, a few weeks. So part of the reason that that truffle is so popular is it really holds up. It's great for chefs. They can work with it, but that's actually true for that Appalachian truffle too. It has probably the best shelf life of any truffle. I've seen it go a couple of months. Um, so it could really work, like chefs could easily work with that ingredient. Um, so thinking about the, the smell, I've never smelled truffles other than truffle oil, which you mentioned in the beginning is hardly smelling truffles at all. Um, are the species similar enough that, you know, if you smell one truffle, you kind of get the sense of what truffles smell like. And then a related question is, if you have a dog that can that can sniff out one species, can that dog then have a fairly good shot at finding other species as well? That is a really good question. Somebody is definitely thinking ahead there. Um, and yeah, that's a challenge for some dogs. Like some dogs get trained too specifically on one truffle, and then they can't um, they can't leap to the other ones. Other dogs seem to be pretty good at um, detecting any of those truffles. So it's really dependent on the dog. Uh, you know. 
different dogs have different personalities um, and skills, but there is like all the truffles share a certain smell to them. And the truffle oil has a bit of that smell to it too, but then each one has a really different vibe. Like the white, white truffle is very sort of intense, like in your face, like garlic and gasoline and prosciutto, um, sweat. The black truffle is a whole different deal. It's much more like warm and comforting and kind of like cocoa and sherry and cured olive, like black olive kind of stuff. So they're very different. Um, each one has, you know, their own appeal and their own fans. Um, so I'm thinking about like other uh, other foods that are renowned for being re like unobtainably expensive and, and um and saffron comes to mind as one that, you know, by weight is extremely expensive, but you only need a few tiny little, you know, stamens for it to actually season your food really thoroughly. And even though like a, you know, a, a quarter pound truffle goes for like what you said, like 700 bucks plus, how many servings are you getting out of that? And how far does, how far does one truffle go? Right. And yeah, that, again, that's a really, um, really observant point um and i do sometimes compare it to saffron because same deal like saffron seems so expensive but you end up you you know two or three bucks is all you need to spend on saffron for a pot of rice or whatever and that's true for a lot of the truffles too like if you really only want to shave a few grams per serving on your food which is usually what you do like you know you've got like a bowl of pasta or something and you're just shaving truffle over the top so um it's still it's not it's not it's still an expensive ingredient, but you might end up spending like five bucks per serving, 10 bucks per serving. Um, what I say to people is often, it's still not as expensive as the wine. <laughs> like <laughs> wine, the wine world has um, done an incredibly good job of training people to believe that they should be spending like this much money on wine. Um, so that if they're only spending this much money, it seems cheap. Um, so truffles kind of like, they try to like learn from the wine world a little bit, but yeah, you can, it, it doesn't have to be like a total deal breaker. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the nutrition of truffles? And the, the thing that got me thinking about this was um, how, you know, the truffles have evolved to basically be irresistible to, uh, to small mammals. And for that to be the case, it must be really it must be a really nutritionally something that's packed with nutrition for, for them yeah, to yeah. want to seek that out. Um, how, how, what is it? What's this nutrition like for, for us? Yeah. And that's, that's something that um, scientists have asked and no one has, no one knows exactly like for us, we eat so little of it. It probably doesn't matter too much. Like it's probably sort of like a zero nutritionally, but the animals, like you say, they're really going for it for a reason. Um, and I've seen certain scientists sort of refer to them as like the salt licks of the forest. So if they're concentrating all these somewhat unusual minerals into a really accessible little ball, that's a great way for animals to get them. So that's my hunch is that it's not a particular cat like type of calorie or something, but probably in terms of rare minerals, they're a great source for animals. For us, they might be a little bit of that too. Um, are there any local restaurants around Vermont where they're on the menu from time to time? Not that I know of, but I really do think that's going to change in a few years as awareness of, of this native truffle comes out. Um, we're pushing seven o'clock. Do you have a few more minutes to answer some other sure. questions, Ron? Um, so I want to turn to kind of the, the, some of the foraging questions. Um, so um, you painted a picture of uh, like folks in, in Istria um, and how they kind of relate to their woods. I'm like, when you're out, um, in that community truffle hunting and you're walking through the woods, are you just coming across other truffle hunters all day long? Like what's the density of truffles in those woods? What's the density of truffle hunters in those woods? And like, what's the relationship between like the truffle hunting community and one another? Like here, like foragers are often extremely um, secretive about their spots. And it's, it's not a community necessarily of, of sharing uh, knowledge and information. And it seemed to be very different than the community you're describing with truffles. Yeah, no, well, no, in some places that's exactly what it's like. Like truffle hunters are very secretive. Um, I had to like work hard to like get them to take me with them um, and like trust that I wasn't gonna reveal their spots, uh, especially if it's their business, you know, like, cause the truffles will come back in the same place every year, just like a, a mushroom. Um, but then there's other places like uh, Motovan Forest, that spot in Istria, it's, um, 
that's a wild, you know, it's a community resource. It's, it's owned by the state and it's well known for its truffles. So yeah, when you're in the woods there, you see people all over the place with their dogs and half of them tend they, to me look like the same people you see walking their dog in any park anywhere. They're kind of just like walking their dog. And if they find a truffle, that's a bonus, but it looked like there were a lot of like hobbyists and part timers. Um, and then people, there's some like privately owned forests that people will actually lease the rights to hunt in that forest. Like that happens in Hungary a lot. So, and then it gets, sort of like the farther east you go into Eastern Europe, the sort of uglier it gets where, you know, you hear, that's where you hear cases of like somebody, it's kind of like lobstering in Maine where there's this like sort of heritage of where you're allowed to hunt or fish. Um, and if, if somebody sort of encroaches on territory that is unofficially, you know, goes with a particular family, you know, they'll come out and their tires will be slashed or something, so. Wow. Um, so, um, a lot of folks are wondering about kind of ecological impacts of this practice, um, both on, on the truffle population itself, as well as the forest. I, and so I imagine that, um, you know, it depends, you know, region to region where you are, if you're in North America versus Istria or, or other, other places in, in Europe, but, um, you know, I'm thinking about the effects of just trampling and 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 just the the effect on the on the local vegetation from so much pressure hunting for truffles as as one big ecological impact. And then um, I'm wondering if there's a, an impact on the truffle population itself um, from harvesting and over harvesting potentially. And if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, the key is dogs. Uh, like it, Oregon's a good example where. Um, so the beauty of a, a dog only detects a ripe truffle. So you, um, and they're usually not that dense. Like, you know, in an acre, you might find one or two uh, ripe truffles. So you're basically following your dog around and the dog is like, oh, try here. And then you, you're digging down a couple of inches and you're getting the truffle. And since the truffle, it's like a fruit, it's like picking a fruit. Um, like that's what the truffle wants. It wants to be eaten. Um, so that's all good. And, you know, you, you fill your little hole um, and there's a certain, you know, there's protocol where you always cover up the hole and, um, and you don't dig too widely. But then what happened in Oregon, they, like, they learned that they had these truffles and they weren't that far below the surface and they were really abundant in places and they didn't have any truffle dogs. This is back like 20 years ago. So a, a culture of raking got started in Oregon where um, people, it was often kind of like, um, people who were, who were like sort of desperate for drug money or whatever, would they go into those Oregon woods with and like literally just rake the topsoil in stands of Douglas fir down several inches and find a bunch of truffles. And most of them weren't ripe, so they didn't actually smell like anything. And they gave Oregon truffles a bad name because of that. Um, and they did a lot of ecological damage. So partly what the Oregon Truffle Festival has done is to create this culture of dog harvested truffles. And now all the chefs out there know to only buy dog harvested truffles and to smell the truffles first. Um, and in Europe, they actually um, are trying to get more people to go out in certain areas. Like Northern Italy, the truffle hunters are really old. Like anyone who saw that movie, the, the truffle hunters, they're old guys. And the, the, the younger people really haven't done it as much. They're not as interested in going into the woods and working hard or whatever. Um, and <laughs> truffles seem to, like they have a bit of a symbiotic relationship with people where um, they do well in forests that are kind of managed and fairly open. So there's actually a push to get some of these more overgrown forests in Europe, um, more managed. Um, they, they, they actually produce more truffles when people were using more firewood and using leaf litter for animal bedding and stuff. Um, so now they're a little overgrown and they're not as productive. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting, huh? Yeah, it's complicated. Uh, let's see. Is there a season for truffle hunting? Are, are folks doing this throughout the whole year where there's not snow on the ground? Or is wh when do people go out and do this in, in the Northwest and in, in, in Europe, I guess? Yeah, they all have their seasons. Like right now is the season in the Northwest. Like though their truffles are, are booming in January and February. Uh, 
and the uh, the French black truffle is also a winter truffle. It's actually called the black winter truffle um, because it's ripe like December through February. So when you're hunting it, it's all, you're always a little bit miserable. That's like cold in the woods, and it only works in places where the ground isn't frozen. Then, which is partly why it's more of a Mediterranean crop. The white truffle is more of a fall truffle, like September, well October through November and into the beginning of December. The Appalachian truffle seems to be like September through November. Like where it grows, again, like once the ground freezes, no one's going to be digging it up, animals or otherwise. So it's learned, it's evolved to, to, to ripen in the fall. Sure. So if, if folks are eager to train up a, a dog and are living in the Appalachians or up here in the Northeast, their target should be September, October, early November. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to get a couple of these, these guys who are actually good at it. To see if they'll come up to Vermont next mm -hmm. September and go out and see see if we find anything. Yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I want to be mindful of your time. Thank you so much for for uh, for sharing with us. Um, I want to encourage everybody to go and pick up Rowan's book. I put a link to it in the chat um, up towards the top of the chat. Well, actually, for you, that's probably the only thing in the chat. Uh, on the participant side of things. Um, so uh, get the book. I know that uh, we didn't answer everybody's questions, but gosh, there are a lot of them. Um, and so if you have any uh, further questions that you'd like to ask, um, feel free to uh, shoot us an email um, and, uh, and get the book and all your other questions will be answered therein, I suppose. <laughs> um, and uh, one more thanks to our sponsors, Hunger Mountain Co-op, um, Onion River Outdoors, Union Mutual, uh, Washington Electric Co-op and Edward Jones office of Keith LaCroix and a huge thank you again to Rowan. Um, thanks so much. And, uh, any, any last words for us or Rowan? Um, get out there with your dog. It's uh, you know, it's win-win and thanks to North Branch Nature Center for hosting. All right. Thanks. Have a good, good night everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time.